Everyone who is having fantastically interesting conversations near the beer, please grab a seat so we can kick everything off tonight. Oh, we got real quiet. All right. Fantastic. All right, everyone, welcome to Atlanta Startup Village number 67. Give yourselves a round of applause. This is the largest monthly meetup of entrepreneurs in the Southeast, so you are in good company. Woo, we are going to be, I think, standing room only tonight. Anybody who has a blank chair next to you is not saved for anyone. Raise your hand. All right, people in the back, I got a couple of seats over here. If y'all want to grab them, everyone is friendly here. Okay, I am Allie. I am your MC. Uh, if you are also interested in presenting, please come see me after for the five-minute presentation, and we can talk through what that entails. So, a couple of pieces of housekeeping tonight. First of all, as you can see, this is going to be live streamed at bit.ly slash village live, and it is recorded, which means that everyone at home will be able to hear you. So please ask your questions in a concise manner that you will be proud of later when you listen to the recording. But the recording is done every single month by the fantastic people at PullSpark. If you guys can all turn around and wave and say, hi, PullSpark. Hi, PullSpark. Yeah, thank you. You're all going to be in a promo video now. Uh, PullSpark has done this on their own every single month because they are lovely people, and that means that the presenters get to look at their recording, or like me, look at the recording every month and be like, don't do that again. So we also have sponsors tonight for beer. Who here is excited about the fantastic beer, free beer, that you just had? Yeah. Okay. That is due to two different people and the space. Let's say that, too. The space is also a kind donation from Atlanta Tech Village. So Kellyanne, please tell us about ATV. All right, hello everyone. I am Kellyanne O'Neill and I am the member success manager here at the Atlanta Tech Village. We're the fourth largest technology startup hub in the nation. We have over 300 companies in this building with over 1,000 members. We think if you have proprietary technology and you're an entrepreneur, your startup should be in the village. If you're interested in what that could look like to be a member and join our awesome community, Check out our website, take a tour, or if you have more questions, come visit us in the back tonight at the sound booth. We'll be happy to chat. Um, also, really quick, if you are interested in being a monthly beer tap sponsor, like iFolio is, please come find me. I'd love to chat and see what that could look like for you. I will be in the back as well. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Kellyanne. And don't worry, if you are the beer sponsor, it is not required that you draw that beautiful piece of artwork back there. They spent hours on that this afternoon. So to that point, the beer tonight is due to iFolio. Chloe, tell us about iFolio. Oh, there's a lot of you. <laughs> um, well, hi, guys. My name is Chloe Gibson, and I am the digital marketing manager at iFolio. Um, iFolio is an enterprise digital portfolio platform. We serve students from sixth grade all the way through college and business professionals entry to senior level executives. My goal is to increase brand awareness. So if you look on our beautiful mural, you'll see our Instagram handle and all of our social handles. So follow that and give us a thumbs up. We would really appreciate your support. Um, also, don't forget to follow our um, Instagram giveaway for a iFolio t-shirt and a chance to win your very own private portfolio. Um, so good luck to everybody. And also, on behalf of iFolio, I want to thank you guys so much for joining us today. And cheers to some awesome pitches. Thank you. All right, so the other thing that we do is we have 30-second volunteers, and that means that they get to take down these chairs that you guys are sitting in later tonight, and in return for that, they get 30 seconds to pitch whatever it is that they would like within reason. So up first, Maurice, everyone deserves water. Where are you? Come on down. Hey, guys. Was anybody here a couple months ago? Yes? You might have saw that presented then. Um, so Azili Water is just a sparkling water brand that we're about to launch. But what we really do is help people who don't have access to clean water. And launching a sparkling water brand is just a good way to reach out to people like yourselves and such that we can do good together. That's about it. Um, all of our social media is Azili Water, at Azili Water, or you could go to everyonedeservewater.com and you can find us, follow us. Thanks. Up next, we've got Rue with Suvi. Warm welcome, y'all. Come on. All right. We're going to do that again. All right. 
Well, thank you. I just prepared a short pre uh, pitch for you guys. Once again, my name is Rue from Zuvi. Here it goes. Top influencers in nightclubs lose $2 million a year and reach under 25% of the market using outdated technology like flyers to generate revenue. Zuvi is a premium offering that fills this major gap in social media and connects this niche. We've proven the value of our engagement platform with ATL nightclubs considered top 20 revenue generating in the country. The Zuvi app has actually just launched in eight states this week, and we're actively seeking advice, mentorship, affiliates, and resources as we continue our $250,000 seed round to explosively grow in our eight states as we dominate the app store, as we project $12 million in sales this year alone. Thank you. We have one more. Walker with Startup Picture Day. All right, we're going to try this again. Round of applause for Walker. So if you're, if you're a founder, you've probably experienced this before. Uh, you schedule a coffee meeting with someone you've never actually met in person. You show up in the coffee shop, and you realize you have no idea who the heck you're meeting with. Uh, you pull out your cell phone. You try to find a picture of them online. All you can find is a picture of their dog on Facebook. Uh, my name is Walker, and I am with Startup Picture Day. We provide free professional headshots for startups and their teams. Next one is going to be before the June Startup Village. So two months from now, I want to see all you guys here a little bit early. Come out. We'll, we'll give you free headshots uh, for you and your team. To get more information or to register for you and your team, go to StartupPictureDay.com. Again, that's StartupPictureDay.com. Thank you. Also, I've seen their headshots. They're really good. Okay, who is ready for our main presenters now? Yes? All right. So up first tonight, Park It Cycles. Hey, how's it going, guys? You doing good? Everybody else doing good? All right. My name's Thad, and I'm with Park It Cycles. And I was here about six months ago presenting on a brand new idea for secure charging stations. But, you know, I had a big problem because I didn't have a market. What was I going to do? Well, in that six-month time frame, we got a market. A $7 billion market. So that's all the bicycles and scooters you see going up and down all over the place. That is the micro-mobility market scheduled to be $200 billion by 2030. And the thing is, uh, in 2017, there were 100,000 more electric bicycles sold than electric cars. Some of these names you might remember, see around, Bird, Lyft, Lime, Uber. The big thing is they have no perceivable long-term charging solution. The bikes, the scooters, riding up and down, the bikes are running around like $1,500 to $20,000, and yet you still got to charge them at home. The scooters, you're tripping over them all over the sidewalks. Uh, but they got to pay people to take them to get them charged. Now, it's just there's virtually zero charging stations for bikes and scooters. So that's what we're making, secure micromobility charging stations, bicycles, scooters. Therefore, they can be held, charged, and you can ride them around without having to worry about you know, it breaking down or you falling over the handlebars, which happens sometimes. Our patented proprietary design, we've already tested that with over 800 people. It holds most every bike on the market, and it's intuitive to children. This is what six of our bike charging stations would look like in one normal-sized car parking space. And we're making apps. iOS and Android will be coming out in the next month so that you'll be able to find and locate these charging stations. Each station holds two bikes, secures with metal bars, the wheel and the frame, now, if you have an electric bike, there are outlets that you can plug your charger into that you got with the sale of your electric bike and little cubbies that you can put those chargers into. So they'll be nice and secure while you go and have a beer or a shop or, I don't know, whatever you want to do out in the public. No judgment. Show you how easy it is to use. You find a location on the app. This is in real time. The guy just puts the bike in. Now, eventually, we're going to have card reading. This was our test out with a prototype. Use the app, it talks to the station, five seconds, your bike's locked up. If you have an electric bike, plug in the charger, put the cubby in the charger in the cubby, you're off to do whatever you want to do 
And on the app, you'll be able to find local deals and steals in the area. So good coupon hunting. <laughs> We, are, we actually are part of the Atlanta Bicycle Coalition. We've been featured in TechCrunch, Disrupt, uh, Disruptor Daily, and ATDC locally, and we were part of the last Flashpoint cohort. And there will be more of those to come, hopefully, because they are really helpful. We do B2B sales, uh, commercial businesses, mixed-use developments, uh, business campuses, even to the micro-mobility share services themselves. And our eventuality is to get into the small towns and municipalities so that there can be a charging station on every corner of every block. The great thing is, it's a cost-neutral sale. All of the EV charger and tax incentives that are going for car charging stations apply to our charging stations as well. So we sell you the charging station, you apply for the tax credits and rebates, and you get your money come back from your purchase and installation. Now, you also get a possible 40% boost in revenue because you now have secure parking at your location. The big news is, is that we're going to be putting stations into Woodstock and Roswell for a pilot program and actually sell to a mixed-use developer. So, woo, we're actually getting the stations out so you can use them. <laughs> now I just need everybody to go ahead and take out their phones. No, seriously, I, I can wait. No, go ahead, take out your phones. We're good. No, I'm good. Yeah, I'm waiting. Because we are launching, as of today, our The Green Monster Lives campaign on Indiegogo. So if you just take a picture of the QR code here, it takes you directly to our campaign page and any contributions will help us to reach our $5,000 goal of getting the next charging station out for people to be able to use. If you don't have the little picture thing where it does the tab down, you could do it at the little website tag on the bottom of the screen here. I'm Thad with Park Kent Cycles and we just want to help you be able to ride around and have enough energy to do it. Questions? We got a question down the front here. So when I bring my bike to charge on your station, how long does it take to give you a full charge on that station? Okay, the question is if he can, brings his bike to one of our stations and wants to charge it, how long does it take to charge if the bike is almost empty? Depending on the brand, it's gonna be two to four hours. And that's just how it is with those brands and everything. We have a uh, AC outlet you plug your charger into the same as you would be plugging into it at home. Now, most of the times you just need to pick me up, so an hour's worth of a drink or a beer or food would be enough to get you on your ride home. Any other question back here? The question is, you know, what if someone were to plug their phone in there? How do you just make sure the phones don't get overcharged? The station, the station outlets do not activate until you use the app to actually lock in your bicycle. So you'd actually have to use the app to lock in your bicycle for those little outlets to activate. And therefore, it's only if someone has an electric bike that they can actually use the station. It doesn't just stay powered all the time for people to charge their phones. In the back here. The question is, do we have battery technology in our station? As of right now, we do not have battery technology in our station. We are plugged directly into the grid. Uh, we are looking to expand into that in the future. Uh, we don't really expect someone to have a dead bicycle. The other question is, if a bicycle's dead, how many bicycles can you actually charge per day? Well, if it's four hours in a day and most of the sunlight's around for around eight to 10 hours, you're looking at about two bikes per day, but we don't really think someone's gonna have a dead bike putting into the station. It's mostly just a power up to at a bar or something to get, get home. And the state question over there, white shirt. Can you charge your whole, uh, bicycle design? The station holds most every bicycle, though it doesn't work with every bicycle design. I'm getting waved at to repeat the question. The station holds most every bicycle on the market. There are some outrageous designs out there that we can't quite fit, but you, most every bicycle design, if it's a reg, looking somewhat like a regular bike, you can fit it in forwards or backwards. It even goes down to fit even kids' bikes. And way in the back, back there. Um, 
Oh, as an electric bicycle owner, how big is this a problem beyond the micromobility shared space? Well, the thing is, is that you right now you're having to rely on a regular bike lock to secure your bicycle, which could, as a minimum, is like $1,500 more, a lot more sometimes. It's regular bike locks can be cut in five seconds with a battery-powered angle grinder that I can buy at Lowe's or Home Depot. So you're out $1,500 right there, and they will not be able to track it. So that was what we started off as a secure bike rack and then moved into a charging station. So we attacked that security problem first. Any other questions? Uh, you can go right there. Yeah. Okay, how much are we having people pay per charge? We're not. It is free charging. We sell this to the property, and it would be like the property having you char pay to charge your laptop. That's the same amount of power it uses. A question over here? Okay, if the individual bike users are not paying per charge, what is the purpose of the app? Data. We're gathering the data of who's using the system, the system where, so then we can take the data and move it on to things like tra uh, traffic planners, city planners, and those type of people to show them how mobility is moving around their city. Say if they wanted to put a bike lane into an area, we can say, okay, these are actual bicycle people going through here, and help to move the funds more appropriately around in a city setting. Down front. Okay, the question was, there's obviously a hardware cost. Is there any other cost involved with this for installation? It's four bolts in the ground, and then we just run a 110 AC cord to the actual station, which means minimal trenching, probably just a couple hundred, about a hundred, couple hundred dollars on top of the actual station. But you make all that back with the tax rebates and incentives that the property gets for having an EV charging station on their property. Nicely done. Thank you, Thad. All right, so if any of y'all were here last month, you know that I'm trying out some new things with swag, so I don't have to throw it because it doesn't work well when I try to throw things, especially t-shirts. So in this room, there are four different chairs that have a pink post-it note under them. Maybe it's orange. I'm not sure. Reach under the front, and if you've got one, there should be one generally in each section, and they are numbered one through four. If you happen to look at the chair next to you and nobody's sitting in it and there's one there, please take that one. I know there's four. I stuck them on here before I sat down. Anyone? Anyone? Oh, okay. I got one over here. Okay. So, in order to win this, what am I holding? Fantastic shirt from iFolio. You have to tell me what it is that you need on your tag and how people can help you with it. So, I'm coming to you. Hang on. You get the microphone. Stand up. Give us your name and tell us what it is that you need. Hi everyone, uh, I am Brianna. I created the venture The English Major Takes Tech, which is dedicated to helping tech companies improve their content and communications. And I came here to attract clients. So people that are looking to boost their writing, web material, blog, et cetera, I'm your girl. Thank you, Brianna. T-shirt. All right, so there are three more in this room for between the next rounds. Take a look under your seat. If you've got them, I have more swag yet to come. Also, you get to say things. If you don't have something on your name tag, you better make something up. Okay, are we ready to go? Oh, okay, apparently I'm gonna give off my mic. So, give it up, warm welcome for our second round tonight, Streaming Global. Thank you all. Uh, before I get started, I just wanna let you know, uh, for all the people that might already know me in the room, some good news up front, I'm gonna be brief. Um, that's not usually the case, well, they're just not giving me much time, so I'm going to have to stop. Um, in addition to that, I just want to ask, uh, to jump right in, quick show of hands, who in the audience already has a streaming subscription? So maybe that's Netflix or Hulu, Amazon Prime. If you're a Trekkie, then that means CBS All Access is more important than bread in your home. That's a lot of hands that went up during that time. Um, 
Back to me, I'm Richard Ostreicher. I'm the CEO of Streaming Global. Uh, we're a technology company here in Atlanta that is, uh, we set out to solve the three biggest pain points in the streaming industry, specifically cost, uh, the ability to be reliable at scale, big numbers, and also the ability to go faster, to lower latency between live events happening and when you see them on those screens of yours. Um, I'm gonna jump in here for just a second, but first I wanna introduce a second company that's not on stage with me, but I need to talk about them because we're gonna use them with this demo and they're just so awesome. Uh, what we did was we invented a way to do live streaming over conventional cloud storage servers. Really fast, really inexpensive live streaming over cloud storage servers. And as a credit to the ecosystem uh, for technology companies here in the Atlanta area, we just happened to run into another company not 30 minutes from us that was hardware accelerating cloud storage servers. So in addition to solving the cost and the latency issues, we were able to work with a company called Hellastorm down the street from us, which is actually increasing scalability uh, on the solution that we're actually providing. They make a chip that hardware accelerates storage servers uh, to offload a lot of the traditional um, upload and compute required to be able to sustain a server at high loads. With them, we can build out live streaming over cloud storage servers that can deliver streams to millions of people, uh, Super Bowl size markets. Uh, I've been challenged, uh, we have one potential customer in India that just mentioned to me there was a cricket match, I don't know if you guys saw this in the news, a billion people watched it, the one match, a billion people. Uh, so challenge accepted, we're gonna go ahead and move forward with that. Um, talking a little bit about what we do, again, what we did was we reimagined what the streaming pipeline should look, for, look like for today's internet. Uh, and we found a lot of wasteful parts. Um, I've been in streaming for a long time. I've been developing tech companies for about 30 years now. Um, and when I created my first stream, it was at Microsoft. Uh, I was lucky enough to be the group development manager for the digital media group there. Um, and this was the early 90s, um, so the early days of streaming. And when we developed things like transcoding and, and other problem solvers, it was because the internet was just a crazy place. There was no broadband, there weren't reliability, I mean, every device needed its own format, its own resolutions, it was really tough. Uh, so basically we used that to, um, when we came back in with this company, we looked at what the internet had become, redesigned it, and we found a lot of wasted pieces that we were able to jettison. And with that new architecture, uh, we've completely changed the economics for delivering streams. Uh, with Hellastorm, the chip, as I mentioned, that, they, that they've brought to the table has allowed us to increase scalability on um, the types of content that we can stream as well, in addition to lowering the cost even further. Uh, the industry pain points, I've already talked about those, so I'm gonna jump through those. Uh, markets are people like uh, OTT, live television. Uh, in addition, the ability to uh, deliver on-demand content, live sports, concerts, that type of thing. But rather than talk about it anymore, I'm just gonna jump in and show you guys an example. We've actually pre-selected four lucky victims. I mean, well, volunteers, we went with volunteers. Um, and if they'll come up front here, we're gonna simulate Kentucky Derby's next week. We're gonna simulate a really quick horse race right here in front of the stage. We're gonna... While they're getting set up, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, latency. It's not a number you hear about, but it's something that's really a pain point for the industry. Uh, we actually did a lot of research on this. Uh, the Super Bowl, if you were watching it uh, on the uh, All Access app, was about 75 seconds behind the real Super Bowl. Uh, in addition, the, um, I'm gonna just change this while I'm talking about that. March Madness was probably about 45 seconds behind live. This is a good dexterity test for me. So I'm just gonna show this on a mobile app on the fly because it's easier than bringing in a sports truck and trying to show you cameras plugged in. You guys ready to start this race? Just a couple things. If your hat falls off, you've gotta pick it up. There we go. All right, that's better. Hold on one second. 
Now this is in a network I don't control in a building I don't work in, and so pretty much all the disclaimers for the worst possible conditions for a live demo. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use this mobile device, stream it through a data center that's not even here, back to that mobile device that you guys are watching. Are you guys uh, ready to start this race? Hold on, let me just do a quick test. Just a quick test. Yeah, it was a little quick. Sorry. Um, okay, we're gonna start this. I'm gonna count you down. And the, the finish line is right here. So I'm gonna try not to fall off the stage, but at the same time, catch a photo finish on this stream. Okay, three, two, one, go. Oh, I think we have a winner. Yeah, we've got, we've got four winners here. That's right, thank you guys very much. And with that, uh, I, I didn't look up at the screen. I was watching the, the jockeys, but uh, I think that was a sub-second latency that was going just mobile to mobile through another dub, uh, data center that's uh, somewhere else in Atlanta. Uh, but I'll go ahead and open it up, see if you guys have any questions. Yeah, in the back. No, you're, you're absolutely right. The uh, profanity filter, as it's called in the industry, is about seven seconds. Uh, oh, sorry, his question was, um, there's a filtered time that all sports networks actually put on a live event to be able to block out uh, curse words and people doing things they shouldn't do, ripping off their clothes and running around on the field. Things that we all know happen in games just don't happen on television. Um, and for that reason, the profanity filter is added. It's about seven seconds, which is about one-tenth of the amount of latency that we're seeing in the streaming industry today for live sports. A lot of the times when we're watching events, we'll get tweets or we'll get texts from friends that have already seen what's happened on a different source before it's happened, which kind of ruins the experience if you're watching a live sporting event. Uh, in addition to that, we've got uh, streaming customers that do auctions and do other, uh, even sports betting, where timing matters. It's actually a matter of law that uh, things become synchronized. So latency is becoming more and more important, especially after the Supreme Court ruling. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, we're about, um, thank you for reminding me of that again. He asked, how much faster are we than all of the other content providers in the industry? So there's cable, there's satellite, there's other streaming providers. There's a lot of different ways to get your content today. Some of it's gonna be over Facebook or over Twitter. Um, with uh, the traditional broadcast networks, we're at the Super Bowl when we measured a comparison, we were about 75 times faster. Uh, for YouTube, we're about 25 times faster. Uh, the best we've seen in the market today is Facebook Live. We're about 10 times faster. Um, Microsoft's Azure network, live media services on that, we're already about 60 times faster, even if we use their own storage servers at the same time. Um, and when we're running on Hellastorm hardware accelerated hardware like you saw here tonight, there's just no comparison. It's, it's true sub-second streaming over the public internet, again, on a network we didn't control. Yes? So the question is, I think, does load on a server affect latency? Uh, part of what we designed with our patent pending technology is the ability to deliver this over cloud storage servers. They're already elastic, they're designed for scalability, uh, and by doing that, uh, we can go to much larger numbers just by scaling up the number of storage servers that are, that are available for that. Um, and as you can see with cloud computing, whether it's AWS or Azure or Google, 
elastic storage is a problem that's been solved. All right, thank you. Thank you all. All right. So, okay, who else found a, I think it's pink, pink post-it under their seat that wants to go? Don't be shy, you're all here for something. Oh, I got one back here, all right. I have a fantastic pair of ATV socks. So I'm coming back here to you. You don't have anything on your tag, so I hope you made up something good, all right. Hey everyone, my name is Tomomi. Um, I came here with Blackwood Impact Group, um, and I came to network with some great people. But in a nutshell, basically what we do is we help um, business owners generate greater revenue so they can finally enjoy the growth of their business. So we're a consulting firm that specializes in revenue generation. So we help improve their sales, marketing, operational departments. And so a lot of presidents of companies come to us and they say, we're struggling because we've got all these leads, but we're having a hard time closing these sales, or we're confused about where our marketing dollars are going. And so we come in, help improve those things so people can enjoy their companies. So I need to network with some great people. So we're always looking for people to network with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here are your socks. All right. So in case you guys missed it, you can also do a very short pitch for your company when you get the, when you get the sticky. Don't worry. Next month, we don't have one in May, but we will have one in June. And I am putting up a spinny prize wheel at that point. So get excited. There will be like giant wheel up here with things. Um, all right. Listen, I'm just trying not to have to throw things into the audience. Nobody wants me to do that anymore. It's bad. Okay, let's give it up for our third presenter of the night, Throning. Round of applause, y'all. Come on. What's up, everybody? I am Marilee Coleman, and I am the CEO of Throning. Today, I'm going to tell you about how Throning has the ability to significantly impact the lives of each and every one of you in this room. This story starts three years ago when I first moved to Atlanta. I had um, a lot of trouble meeting new people. I was new to Atlanta, didn't have a lot of friends, didn't have any family in Atlanta. So I tried downloading some meeting apps and what I found is that these apps were event targeted versus people targeted. Um, I also found that one-on-one -on -one meeting apps that required you to network within the app were very awkward and it was very inauthentic to meet people via these apps. I did eventually make some friends, um, but it was a very time consuming process. It actually took me two years. Two years of missed opportunities and missed experiences. Um, and fast forward to today, the same technology solutions still exist. And this is why we created Throning. Throning is an app that allows users to specifically match with the type of people that they are seeking to meet based on select targeted criteria. These targeted criteria include age, relationship status, sexual preference, and location. We match our users with these types of people through exclusive events. That's right, we align our users with the type of people that they are seeking to meet. We truly believe that the best place to build relationships and create authentic real networks is in person, and that is also why we created Throning. Throning also has a point system. Um, so when a user attends an event, they are given the opportunity to give points to individuals that they meet based on their own interactions with that individual. If they like somebody a lot, you can give them up to 500 points. If you don't like somebody at all, you don't have to give them any points. The um, individual within the app that has, or within the event that has the highest score is crowned the king of the event. Um, they're also featured within the app um, on the event as the king of the event. So now I'm gonna do a quick demo for you. Sorry, the mic keeps going out. Okay, so um, Throning is actually currently in beta, but we have the app fully built out. So when, once you create a profile, when you go to the home screen, these are the three buttons that you have the opportunity to go through. The first one is explore events. The second one is my events. So these are events that I'm going to or events that I've created. And the final one is meet people. So first let's go to explore events. Um, here I'm matched with an event that is in line with my targeted profile. I can also see individuals um, within the event and see other events that they are attending. Okay. 
Okay, so now we'll go back home and we'll go to meet people. So similar to explore events, I can scroll through and see different people, their profiles. I can also see events that they're attending um, and join these events. So that's just a general kind of overview of how um, Throning operates and how it's set up. So we plan to monetize. We plan to monetize Throning through three main revenue streams. The first is a premium version of the app. With this premium version, um, users will get additional features that are not included in the free version of the app. Um, users who do not sign up for the premium version will be subject to ads. This ensures that regardless of if an individual is um, using the subscription version or not, we will still continue to be able to monetize the app. Um, also, based on the nature of Throning, we have amazing insight into um, emerging trends within the marketplace, so we definitely do plan on um, monetizing the data that we have at our fingertips. We are currently seeking $500,000 for 30% equity within Throning. We're also looking for individuals to join the beta. Um, if you're interested in joining, you can go to www.throningapp.com and follow us on Instagram. Does anyone have any questions on Throning? Yes. The question was, if you're using the free version, how often will you see those ads? Um, you know, right now we're still working through exactly what the ad um, environment's gonna look like, but I would say something that is similar to the, the amount of ads and the quantity of ads that you're seeing within Instagram. Uh, the question was, what is our demographic? So based on the, the nature of Throning, we really think that this product can appeal to a wide variety of individuals. Anyone from a baby boomer to someone who just graduated college or even is still in college. Yes. The question was, will a business be able to pay to have their business rank higher than other businesses? Um, so one of our market implementation strategies is to partner with businesses um, because Throning does provide businesses with an amazing opportunity to drive traffic directly to their place of business. Um, eventually, once Throning starts to pick up some traction, we do plan on charging businesses for this service. Yes. Okay, the question was who is our direct competition and who is our indirect competition? Um, I would say that our direct competition is Meetup. We're at a Meetup right now. Um, however, Throning is a completely different product because we are focused on the who when at an event, not necessarily what the event is about. Um, in, in addition to that, I'd say apps like Bumble BFF, that's another app that I would say would be our direct competition. Yes. You. Yes, you. The question is, what are we going to use the 500K for? So part of our implementation strategy is to have what we call dragons um, or brand ambassadors and have them across the country. Because of the nature of Throning, this app is only going to be valuable to users if there are a lot of users in their location on the app. And so we have to focus specifically on select markets and make sure um, that we get as many people on the app at one time as possible. And to do that, we plan to use these ambassadors or dragons. Yes. Great question. So the question was, how do we combat false information, such as people pretending to be someone they are not? Um, so to log into Throning, users are required to use a government-issued ID or a Facebook account. So you cannot create more than one account um, 
so in addition to that, you know, we have great reporting tools. So if someone is pretending to be someone that they are not, um, we are always just one click away. Any other questions? Wow. I'm ahead of time. Sorry. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, yes, back here. Question was, how did I arrive at my evaluation? Um, well, we tried several different metrics. We did a DCF. We um, did a net present value calculation. And at the end of the day, um, the numbers that they were coming out with were insane. So we cut them back significantly and um, came up with a number that we feel comfortable with and we think is a fair evaluation. Yep. The question was, have you arrived at a cost per user acquisition like a dating app? Um, so we do have a few analysis that we've done based on the capital that we need to get our target user base, um, which is looking at around $6 a user initially, but we plan to um, gain a lot of traction from that down the line. Yes. Uh, the question is, what is our strategy to acquire our ambassadors? Um, so we're, we plan on doing good old-fashioned recruiting through online, um, online um, products. Yeah. Great question. The question was, how, do we, how did we come up with the name? Um, it took a really long time. <laughs> and, and, it, and it has nothing to do with Game of Thrones. That never came to mind, sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Also, can we give a round of applause to Marilee who repeated all of her questions? She is one of four people in the two years I've been doing this that has managed to do that, so congratulations. All right, you know where this is going. I have another fantastic shirt. Who has? I follow your shirt. I know there's two more in the audience. Who's got them? Who's got them? One over here. All right. You got to be more enthusiastic about it. I got to get to you with a microphone. All right. And your name is Spencer. Spencer, tell us what you need. Uh, my name is Spencer. I'm with Morgan Stanley. And I help uh, businesses and startups get uh, interesting ways to find liquidity as well as helping the merger and acquisition space. What can we help you? Uh, just being people like the people presenting today so that I can help them. Thank you very much, Spencer. We appreciate you. All right. Okay, I, I like this playlist. Yes. <laughs> he tried to give me some really, really low-key music last time. I was like, all right, we're very excited up here. Okay, our fourth presenter. So first of all, y'all, I have to tell you a story briefly about Brent, our next presenter. So every now and again, I have people who say they're going to present, and then they back out like a week before, which is sad. And then I have to backfill. And as you may know, there are three requirements for presenting at Startup Village. You're a startup, you're based in Atlanta, and you have something you can demo for four to five minutes. That's it. Brent is based in Dothan, Alabama. So he technically does not fit the requirements. However, Brent has been to four, five Startup Villages driving all the way from Dothan for the last, I don't know, six months. And every time he's like, please, can I present? And I'm like, oh, Brent, you don't fit, I'm sorry. And so this time, a week ago, somebody backed out and Brent immediately is like, hello, me, I would like to present it, please put me on. And so you know what, Twitter Brent miracle. is presenting. So yeah. all right, Brent, take it away. All right, thanks, as she said, I am from LA, uh, Lower Alabama. Um, <laughs> A lot of great things going on down there, but not as much as ATL. I'm a big Braves fan, too, so any excuse to come to Atlanta, and I'm excited about it. So first, I want to tell you, uh, yeah, my name is Brent Skipper. I am the founder and CEO of Headhunter. Um, job search is broken, um, and as you can see by the, by the domain name, um, jobsearchisbroken.com. How many of you have ever been to an interview where uh, you're either taking the interview, applying for a job, or maybe you're even giving the interview, and you sit down, and in the first 20, 30 seconds, 
you know this isn't a good fit, all right? I mean, it's, you can raise your hands if you want to, but I know you've, everybody's been in them, okay? That is a tremendous inefficiency in the job search market, and it's broken. It's a waste of your time as the applicant. It's a waste of their time as the employer. And that's why you see all of these you know, Forbes articles about how it costs thousands of dollars to fill just an entry-level job flipping burgers at your local uh, McDonald's or whatever. And you may be thinking, no way, it doesn't cost me that much. Yes, it does. You quantify it, all of the eyeballs and hands that have to touch and review and look over and schedule uh, any kind of an uh, application process, and uh, it gets expensive really quick. So I want to jump into the app here. Um, okay. So, yeah, the job boards, it's pretty much a numbers game. There's no transparency. Everybody's skeptical. I don't believe your resume. You don't believe my job description. It kind of, it just makes everybody uh, demoralized. And literally, there's tons of data. If you just Google it, it's just unbelievable how 83% uh, of uh, job seekers are frustrated by the process. And I'm speeding through this because I want to get to a demo. Um, but uh, dating, professional training, customer service, even doctor visits are now on mobile on video. Guys, that is the way everything is moving, is mobile video. So why not job search? Uh, the efficiency and the attractiveness of uh, video is, is just undeniable. And uh, hopefully we'll all be able to embrace it soon. This is a $200 billion market that has never been disrupted. Video interviews are not the answer. That's been done. It's being done. It's a great convenience, but that is not what Headhunter is about. We are a video hiring network that connects job seekers and employers with video on mobile. All right, there's some screenshots there. But what we do is we require both sides. This is a two-sided network. We require video job previews from the employers and video resumes from the applicants in order to level the playing field, which has never been done before, okay? No matter what format you're looking at or what platform you've ever used. And here's some more screenshots, obviously. Now, how do you use it? Well, an employer can use the Headhunter hyperlink uh, as your careers page. You, everybody, once you create a video job preview, you get a hyperlink. You can use it anywhere you want to. You can put it on Indeed. You can use it in Workday, your AT ATS, whatever. You blast it out. You say, hey, here's our job description, but if you really want to see what we're about, click on this hyperlink for a video job preview and tell us if you're interested. If they add you to favorites, you get a mobile notification that says Brent Skipper liked your job listing. You tap on me, and you get to see my video job, uh, video uh, resume. So uh, lots of collaboration and other tools put in. Uh, no training, no contra uh, contracts, monthly billing. Doesn't interfere with ATSs because we're just hyperlink driven. Uh, this is a way to empower and humanize your process. So let me just jump right in here. Man, it's already down to like a little over a minute. Yeah, it does. OK. So um, here we go. I'm going to start you out with, let's look at, um, is this up? It's not on this TV, but this is a men's warehouse, wardrobe consultant. I mean, the general manager just literally, he, they, they put in a job description on here. They get on here, and, and then they just, I'm not going to press play. But you can see he's just giving some curb appeal. The whole time, he's just talking into his phone, introducing himself as a general manager. He's like, you know, this is our store. This is what it looks like. This is the floor. Uh, this is what you're going to be, you know, doing. You're going to be doing hemming or just taking measurements, all of that. And the whole time you're getting to know the general manager, who's the guy you're actually going to be working with, okay? Here he is again. If you don't like beards and ponytails, this probably isn't the guy you want to work for, okay? So, but that's how we keep it real. That is the personal humanized experience that we have. And then uh, I'll go to, this is the, uh, in the uh, Job Seeker app. This is my resume, uh, my video resume. Let's say I create it. Um, I can share it uh, with anybody that I want to, you know, just right through the phone. Again, it's all just done through a hyperlink. And another job uh, preview here. Look at this guy. He's got a job. He's got a dirt dopper nest behind him, you know, and he's like looking for an admin assistant. Anyway, th these are just all random. Anyway, but uh, that's uh, kind of how, how it works. And... Um, a role where I can assist in the growth and development. This guy's of here, by the way. He just he just found me, Patrick. He's awesome. Uh, anyway, but uh, he just popped up this uh, tonight with his profile, and that's uh, that's my five minute. I'll now do a Q and A. But I think y'all get the gist of it. This is a way to truly humanize and personalize the hiring experience, so that both sides benefit from less time wasted, more efficiencies, 
and uh, a lot of money saved on your bottom line. If you don't believe me, ask your controller. All right, Q and A. There's lots of other tools in here that I didn't even, I didn't even get into, but yes. 50 bucks per job listing per month. Uh, repeat the question, how much does it cost? 50 bucks per job listing per month is the most uh, it is, and then it just gets cheaper with volume. Uh, and the ROI is essentially, if I can save you one to two hours per job opening, uh, then it pays for itself, when in reality, the early data we're getting is 10 to 20 hours saved per job opening. You'd be surprised how long it takes you to go through those uh, applications and interview or uh, resumes. Do we have an option for anybody that's a little more introverted? They can always, well, just like today, you know, you can, you have the option to apply with link, LinkedIn or you can do it the traditional way. So it's, it's, it's up to the individual. Yeah. Uh, not built into our app uh, because again, we, we can't, but you can't bother anybody on our app without mutual uh, interest. So if I like your job, um, I, I can't call you, I can't text you, I can't email you through the app unless there's mutual interest. You have to look at my video resume and then once we both sync up there, uh, that's when it pops up on the app, you're able to uh, you're like this guy, Patrick, I'm going to add him to favorites. It says so close. Uh, oh, I've got to have a job listing or whatever you uh, done. So it prompts me to have a job listing. The various skills. And uh, anyway, sorry. But yeah, without mutual interest, you can't, you can't call, text, or email anybody through here. Uh, so, that I've acquired. Sorry. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, front. Front. Sorry. Yes. Is there any intellectual property? Uh, yes. Uh, nothing filed yet, but yeah, we do have the trademark on Headhunter app as well. Uh, so, yes. Are we charging the job seekers? Job seekers are always free. You can create your video resume right now, post it on top of your cover sheet, post it on top of your resume, put it in your LinkedIn profile, and uh, put it in as your personal website. And uh, it's a great way to stand out in the job search because as an employer, I can tell you if you put a video link at the top of your resume and you tell me that's available, I will not read your resume. I will click on that link. I want to see your video. So uh, if, you, and, you know, if anybody that's been there as a hiring manager or as a business owner, they'll tell you the same thing. If they don't, they're lying. Okay, yes, sir. Any way to review, like a virtual assistant in the app, uh, to uh, rate your interview? No, uh, not not yet. Prior to, you can just record it, delete, record, delete as much as you as much as it takes. Yes, in the middle. Which industry we're going for? No product market fit yet. I don't have enough data for that, which is why we're here. Anybody that wants to demo this during our beta, totally free. All I ask is two things. You're patient when we find bugs, and you give me lots of feedback so we can develop the right features. And as we gather that data, we're going to uh, get product market fit or hopefully identify it. But everything from food and beverage and retail all the way up to we've had ads for CFOs and executives uh, it, it's, it's really applicable at any, at any level. It's really, really cool, really powerful. Yes, any, uh, who's next? Yes, sir. Discriminatory, discriminatory practices. Good question. Um, discrimination usually happens uh, at a human level. You know, like it's a shame that people can use technology for bad things as well. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the individual is one that commits it. And plus, when it comes to LinkedIn uh, and other things, I mean, I, was at, I go to tons of career fairs on college campuses, and in the corner, there's always a photo booth for to get your professional headshot for LinkedIn. And uh, if somebody's going to sue for discrimination on technology, they would sue them first because they're a big billion-dollar company. 
So the answer is really, really no, or it's not a big concern right. of ours. Thank you so much, Brent. We appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Hey, anybody that schedules a demo, I got free T-shirts, American Apparel Headhunter T-shirts. I'll give you one if you schedule a demo with me tonight. Find there me. There you go. Okay, I got one more piece of swag. Who has the other sticky? I, I know there's one more out there. Who has it? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, if nobody claims the sticky, I have a really fantastic ATV hat, so the first person who tells me that, uh, that they want to go. Oh, all right. You know what, Adam? You look like you're a little young to need something from this crowd. However, I will give you the opportunity to tell me something that you need. How about that? Stand up and tell us your name and tell us why you're here tonight. My name is Adam and I'm here because I wanted to see if there are any cool jobs that I can internship at for high school. Bring it home, Adam. All right, this young man will be over here after and you get a hat. Thank you so much, Adam. Nicely done. Yes. That is taking initiative. Okay, okay. We are up for our final, last but not least, of the night. So give it up for Motivo. Hi, my name is Rachel McCrickard. I'm the CEO and founder of Motivo, and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. The American Counseling Association says that Motivo is solving the most important problem facing the mental health profession today, and I'm thrilled to explain how we do it. This is a picture of me at my graduation. I had just completed my master's degree and there were two things I didn't know. One, I didn't know that my graduation cap was on backwards. <laughs> Seriously, not one person alerted me to this the entire day. <laughs> and two, I didn't know that it was going to take me three more years and 8,000 more dollars in order to obtain a credential as a licensed therapist. You see, for a therapist, getting your degree is actually the easy part. It's becoming licensed that is so hard. This is something that few people realize about becoming a therapist, so let me quickly explain how it works. Very similar to residency for a doctor, new therapists are required to complete two to four years of face-to-face -face consultation with another therapist before licensure. This process is called clinical supervision. These sessions happen face-to-face -face and cost between $80 to $150 an hour. It's the responsibility of the new therapist to find and pay for these supervision hours. However, supervisors are often very difficult to find and very expensive, especially in rural areas. I experienced this problem myself on my road towards licensure. I drove four hours round trip from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Atlanta, Georgia every week to get my supervision hours that I needed for licensure. So my 200 hours actually became 800 hours with drive time. This is a pain point experienced by every social worker, therapist, and addiction counselor who enters the field. Over the last few years, I've thought there has to be an easier way. Then, in 2016, Georgia passed this licensure rule, giving permission to see supervisors remotely through secure video conference. I thought, someone should really do something about this opportunity. And then I thought, wait, I should do something about this opportunity. 45 states have recently begun to allow supervision to occur through secure video conference. That's why I created Motivo. It's an online platform that matches a new therapist with a clinical supervisor. They meet together remotely every week and pay directly through the platform. The platform includes video ses sessions, scheduling, billing, and record keeping. The business model is very simple. simple. The therapist pays Motivo at an average rate of $65,000 $65, $65 an hour, and we pay the supervisor as an independent contractor and take a 23% cut of each session. Let me quickly show you how it works. So someone would come to our platform and they would uh, click the button to find a supervisor. Obviously this is a double-sided marketplace, so you can also create an account to become a supervisor or you can uh, create an account to find a supervisor. So you'd be looking through our directory of over 240 supervisors licensed in 42 states and then decide which one is right for you. 
once you decided this is the person that I want to meet with, we um, introduce the two through a secure video call and determine if it's a good fit. Once the match has happened, then they meet together every week and pay uh, securely through the platform. This is the team of people who is solving this problem with me. So myself, James Hernandez is our lead developer, Andy Rocker is our head of customer success, and Lauren Patrick is our head of marketing. <laughs> And this, yeah, you can clap for, yes. <laughs> it's a good pause to clap, yes. Um, and this is our team of advisors um, as well. So David Hardwick, who's here, CTO of Better Cloud. Greg Hearn, who's here, who's our um, uh, product advisor. Michael Cohn, who um, is the managing director of Techstars. Um, just step back from that, actually. Uh, but former managing director of Techstars. And then Tim Howells on our board, who is uh, with Cox Enterprises. Um, over the last six months, we've really been able to generate some early traction. We just graduated from Techstars Atlanta, and where we launched the first version of our product, we're generating 8,000 in monthly recurring revenue. We just signed our very first large strategic partner, which is the American Counseling Association, which will give us access to 55,000 therapists, as well as uh, four university partners. We're rate, thank you, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> We're raising a $1 million seed round right now. It's led by Cox Enterprises. We'll grow the team from four to six. We're looking for a React full stack developer. I said that so perfectly. React node full stack developer. See me afterwards if you know of anybody who'd be interested in that, um, as well as a sales lead. Um, thanks so much. Yes. How do we vet our backgrounds of supervisors? Yes, yeah, so um, the supervisor must um, consent that they are representing themselves accurately based on the um, standards of the profession. Um, so all therapists are um, vetted by licensure boards already. So we vet their licensure credential, but the boards really do that vetting process for us. Yes? Oh, you know something about the field, don't you? <laughs> okay, so oh, you are a social worker. Okay, so she asked, will it be for individual supervision or um, group supervision? So therapists have to have several different forms of supervision, individual hours as well as group hours, and that's one of the benefits of the site is that you can meet other people who um, to formulate a group that might be another part of the state. So yes, we do individual dyad and group supervision, and those are different price points for each. Yeah, right, yeah. Who would do that? Um, yeah, so the question was uh, partnering with graduate school universities. Is that what you mean, or undergrad universities? When you're on your way. Yeah, so um, you do have to complete clinical supervision. He's asking whether or not you would partner with universities. Yeah, so um, yeah, you do need clinical supervision in your last year of graduate school and the two years that follow. So we've already started that process with universities, getting them onboarded to the platform in their very last year of college so that they can just continue on. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so um, we need a sales lead. That would be mostly for uh, B2B sales for mental health agencies. So the other person um, kind of in this uh, business model are uh, community mental health agencies that oftentimes will pay for supervision on behalf of their pre-licensed staff. So the salesperson would be focused on uh, generating leads for community mental health agencies. Yeah, how many users we have today and what's our growth rate? So um, we have 886 paying customers. That represents 8,000 in monthly recurring revenue, uh, growing by about 25% monthly. Yeah. Does the state, the licensure state? Yeah, yeah. That's one of the complicating things about solving this. Yeah, um, yeah. The, um, I'm sorry, can you ask it again? <laughs> 
the, the different does the how do we to comply with the laws from like state by state licensure? Um, yeah, that's one of the more complicating parts of uh, the problem that we're solving because every state has a different set of requirements. So, um, so we're learning a lot about that and we're also partnering with state boards to help bring clarity to those rules. Yeah, the total addressable market for the clinical supervision market is 780 million. Uh, it's a very niche market, and we really feel that we'll be able to um, kind of grow from the viral users of the marketplace itself. Marketplaces have a lot of power. So our goal is to um, acquire 7% of the total addressable market in the next three years. That's 8,000 uh, therapists. Uh, but the lifetime value of each customer is pretty high. So that represents $109 million in uh, GMV and uh, $24 million in net revenue. That's our goal. I will say, too, that we, we look at clinical supervision as being a wedge into a much larger market. So we want to capture the clinical supervision market because we're a first mover in this space. But um, once a therapist becomes licensed, they have to continue collecting hours each year to recertify. It's called continuing education. So we're looking at that market next. Yes? Yes. Um, can the people be from all over the states and what's our expansion plan? So yeah, definitely, I mean, we have customers all over the U.S. right now, as well as from Germany and Canada. Um, so, you know, this is an international problem as well, because overseas they don't have access to the level of, um, of education sometimes, in, particularly in the mental health field that we do here in the U.S. So, um, so we'll continue to expand within the same vertical of our market, as well as horizontally to other markets that have a similar pain point, uh, such as um, occupational therapy, speech and language pathology. Several of those go through the same process. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for coming out. We do skip May because of Memorial Day, but we will be back the last Monday in June, so please join us for another five. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.